think about questions, especially in our relationship with God, I think that we oftentimes think about Him or us asking Him a question. A lot of times we think about, and, and I think that's appropriate. You know, we got a new one of these, and I'm not sure if I break it or what. But what's that? It may be operator error. I'll try to sit very still. Um, you know, in some estimations, though, in, in the Gospels record over 300 questions that Jesus asked. 300 questions. So it started me to, to, to think, like, what would it be like? And I was, this is a year or so ago. What would it be like for Jesus to ask me a question? Part of that's really interesting because he's not going to ask you anything he doesn't know the answer to. So the question is not for his information's sake. Uh, and, then, and then secondly, I started thinking about why did Jesus ask so many questions? Why, what, was, what was behind all of that? And, and one of the ones that I will we'll get to, and this will be a series on, on his questions, but one of the ones that really got me to thinking about that was around this past Easter when Jesus asked Mary, and he said, Woman, why are you crying? And I just began to think about that. I put myself in her place and, and understood that, that Jesus was not confused about what her tears were about, but that maybe, maybe she was. And he asked that question to bring clarity. You know, in recent years, I've, I've begun journaling uh, my prayer. So, so a lot of times, um, not necessarily every day, but pretty regularly, I will write out uh, what I'm praying, whether that's the, if I'm praising God or I'm asking for people's blessing or healing or goodness to come on or uh, whatever I might be doing, even just simply just writing out how I am doing, just expressing my present condition to God, write all that out. But what really got powerful was when I started writing out what I sensed God saying back to me and responding. Now, I don't want you to think that I, I've gone off the deep end there and that, that I hear some audible voice in my office or in my living room and that I'm writing down and I'm recording these things. These are impressions, of course. But it does stop me and slow me down long enough that I, I've it's trained my ear, so to speak, to hear God's voice and to know how interactive He desires to be with us. And so one of the things that has, has happened is that I have discovered that He's still in the business of asking questions. And it always stumps me. It always causes me to pause when I sense God asking me a question. And sometimes it's, what are you really looking for here? Or a question like that. Or what do you think you feel that way for? Or why do you want me to do that? And, and uh, they're never questions that I can just give a quick flippant answer to. Um, and it's been very helpful for me. And so uh, sometimes, you know, like when I get stopped in my track and it stumps me, it lingers with me, and I think this is at the heart of the question that Jesus asks, is that it penetrates, and it causes me to respond to him in a little bit different way than I otherwise would. And so in this series of, of messages on, on Jesus saying, let me ask you something, because, because that's kind of the tone that I want us to hear these things. That is, if you are sitting with Jesus, conversationally interacting with Jesus, and he stopped in the conversation and said, you know what? Let me ask you something. What would that be like for you? I mean, before you heard the question, but he just knew that Jesus was going to ask you something and that there is no way to pose there, no way to be anything other than honest. That is, your dishonesty, if we were going to answer dishonestly, would only reveal that about ourselves, that both parties at the table, so to speak, are going to know that that's not the real answer. So there's no way to pull the wool over his eyes. So there's only, it's refreshing is what I'm getting to, is to answer a question with utter honesty is powerful when you're known and loved perfectly by him. So have you ever got, I was thinking about this just this morning, have you ever gotten a text from somebody who sent it to you thinking you were somebody else? Never happened to you? Worse yet is have you ever sent that text to somebody you thought it was somebody else. I, again, I think I did it last night, and I, usually it's when there's three people texting me at one time, and then I respond to the wrong one. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you get that text, you're like, 
what? You know, you read the text, and it's like, did you stop by the grocery store on the way home? And I'm like, well, I'm in Kansas City, Kelly, but, you know, or whatever. You know, the, I'm sorry. Uh, the question makes no sense to the context because it's not really intended for you. And I think sometimes, I, I know sometimes, um, when, we're, when, we're, when we're responding to God, sometimes his questions to us feel that way. I mean, they feel out of the blue. And I'm really speaking for me personally, but I think that as we listen for his questions, sometimes we're, I think we're going to relate to that. What I've found, though, what I've found, though, is that God's questions reorient me to what really is most important. So sometimes they do feel like that text that was sent to me by mistake until I linger with it for a minute. I'm like, oh, that's what I really need to be thinking about. And they reorient my thinking. Um, I'm, so I'm going to challenge you, even at the beginning of the message, to just even begin to let God ask you some questions. Even if they are questions that he asks other people in the scriptures. You just want to use those questions. Uh, and, and just ask yourself, kind of to, to invite yourself into that, and then to learn to respond to God honestly. It is powerful, powerful. So I think this is going to help us relate to God in some ways, but I think it's also going to reveal some stuff about us because some of the questions, the questions we'll be looking at are pretty... Um, Universal in terms of their audience, who, who could they be intended to? So, so we're going to look at that, and the question we're going to ask today is particularly that way. Um, uh, when, if, if, you know, if you aren't careful to remain aware of who Jesus is, if you aren't careful, let me even say intentional about being aware of the identity of Jesus, I'm going to have to get another mic, so hold on. Otherwise, that's going to be for naught. I can ignore some things. We're trying to fix that problem. Can I just use this? That'd be okay. Let's see if I can. Are we on? On? going to have to revert to my notes. This does, it does happen in our relationship with Jesus, so I want to ask you to ask yourself those questions and see where that takes you. So that's the front end, we'll kind of book in the message with that challenge, but I really want you to begin to let him do that. And so we're going to walk through questions today uh, like, like this one, Jesus asking uh, his disciples two things, who do people say that I am? And then he turns it and says, but who do you say that I am? Now, I, let, me, let me preface that by saying this. When Jesus asked, who do people say that I am, it wasn't because he was curious about what are they saying about me out there. Because you can kind of read that that way pretty easily when he says, hey, hey, Peter, who do people say that I am? Or the disciples, who are people, what are they saying about me out there? And then, and then can you imagine him turning right after that and looking dead into their eyes and saying, now, who do you say that I am? It is an important question. And if we don't keep reorienting ourselves to that, we will come to bad conclusions. We'll just slip into a lesser notion of who Jesus is. And here's the premise of this whole thing today, is that the identity of Jesus is going to determine your response to Jesus. Who you see and understand Jesus to be determines everything about how you're going to respond to him. So you respond to different people in your life based on who they are to you. And the problem with, we have with Jesus oftentimes is, we, is we, we, we tend to swing the pendulum really far one way or the other. That he's this a human person who is a good teacher, one end, to he's God and doesn't relate to me well, but he's God and he's all-powerful on the other end. And Jesus, the reality of who Jesus is is both. He's right in the middle of that. He's fully human and fully God. But I, I know, I know, even in my own journey, that I can begin to relate to him out in an out-of-balance way. So this is a very, very important question. So if you have felt 
distant or out of joint or sync with Jesus or in your relationship with God lately, or maybe you've really never connected even uh, with, with him in this level, in this kind of personal way about who he really is. This could tremendously reorient you and bring us back to a place. So don't, don't let the, uh, the apparent simplicity of this, if, you are, if you're a Christian who's been around for years and, and, and you, you think, hey, this is a really kind of surface level message, um, I want to remind you that there's nothing surface level when Jesus asks a question. It, it can go as deep as we need it to go, and it can meet you just right at the very beginning of your journey with God either way. So because it is that significant, um, and because we are, are walking through the very Word of God, I want to just pause and ask God to, to lead us and to truly, truly guide us through this time. So if you pray with me. Father, I need you right now, and we need you, because I don't want to give a speech today to people. I don't want to just say words on a paper or on my notes. I don't want to just plow through a sermon. God, what I want to do, what really is deep, deep in my heart, is I want to communicate what you want to communicate to your people. I want to give voice through this human vessel of my body to the truths and the realities that you long for us to embrace, to know, and to live out of. So that requires much more than me. So I throw myself down willingly, eagerly at your feet and say, I can't, but you can. And I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but I can do nothing apart from you. So I ask you for your wisdom, for your help, and your power to bless this message for myself, but also for this congregation, for your great glory. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you the setting before we go into the question that what's going on right now in this in this passage in Matthew, uh, verse sixteen, that we or chapter sixteen where we just read, um, Jesus has uh, just had a verbal exchange with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Ironically enough, it's not by coincidence though. It is a an exchange about identity ultimately, and they're asking him to prove it, to prove who you are. They say, so you give us a sign. Jesus says something kind of kind of veiled to them uh, again I think that is intention to make them think and to wrestle with where they really are but his, his response to them is, is this is a uh, uh, wicked and evil generation asks for a sign I'm not giving you any sign except the sign of Jonah the sign of Jonah was a, a picture of his, of his death and burial and resurrection so that's what he was referring to there but not, I don't, we don't have any indication that they really grabbed hold of that so he tells them um, that they seem to be good, he says to the Pharisees, easy for me to say, Pharisees and Sadducees, he says to them, you can figure out the weather based on what the sky looks like in the morning or the evening, but you're having a really hard time figuring out who I am. You're, you can interpret the weather, but you're not interpreting the reality of what's happening right in front of you. And their false teaching, he goes on to warn about, saying, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he wasn't talking about real leaven. He was talking about their false teaching, which was based around their misunderstanding or their lack of understanding of who Jesus was. It goes back to his identity. And then there's this lead-in question as he comes back to the disciples and he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So he gives himself a title. He gives himself a he's like He's kind of like the teacher who's giving you the answer in the question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And, and But Jesus' identity right here is the buzz. It's literally the buzz. People are, are wrestling because he's doing some things that, that people can't explain. And the religious people can't explain it either. And they don't know. And they don't want one answer. They don't want that this is God in the flesh. That's an answer that they're not open to. So they're trying to redefine him. But it gets harder and harder the longer that Jesus keeps doing the things that Jesus does. I mean, blind people are seeing people who are dead are, are coming back to life people who have leprosy are being cleansed all of these kinds of things are happening and, and in their own religious context that meant and that was declarative that the people's sins were forgiven and that God was only God could do this because only God could cleanse a leper because God would forgive the sins and then the evidence of the forgiveness of the sins would be that the leprosy was gone. Same would be true of blindness or anything else. So by his own actions, it was almost, it, was, it just seems ludicrous, according to the theology of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that they would deny who he is because his works were testifying to those very things. But yet they were struggling because they didn't want 
to admit or to come to grips with who he really was. So he asked that question, who do people say that I am? And some were saying, hey, he's John the Baptist, and I'll explain why they're saying this. Uh, some were saying he's Elijah, some were saying Jeremiah, one of the prophets. In other words, he was one of these great men of God who has gone on before us and who has now returned in this body. Uh, and, and other, but the bottom line was it's not necessarily whether he's John the Baptist or Elijah, but he was a human being. They were still saying he was a really powerful person, and he's come back. God has done it, but he is not God. He is somebody that God is using or God is empowering. So while they're thinking that Jesus was one of those individuals who had formerly shown great power, they were all still just men. So they really were off the mark on who he was. Now, push pause just for a second as we walk through this, and I'm asking you the question again, or I'm just going to propose this concept again who you see who you understand Jesus to be is going to de- not maybe it's going to determine how you relate to Jesus how you respond to him and it was doing that right then and this was Jesus's work to put on display not just tell people verbally but to put on display the reality of who he was the son of God and the son of man He was God in the flesh. The Word had become flesh. The living Word of God had become a human being and was dwelling among humanity. So he asked them that question. And they say, hey, all of these things. It's kind of, you know, ask anybody, you might get a different question. But it all boils down to, at that point, he was a person. Then he comes to this key question. He turns to them, and this is where everybody but impulsive Peter seems to fall silent no one backed him up no one argued but it's peter who's recorded the answer he looks at the disciples and he says who do you say that i am who do you say that i am can you imagine i mean i get the privilege of just kind of walking through this slowly at my own pace and and i realize that but i want you to do that with me just for a minute can you imagine i mean even right now knowing all that you know having the scriptures written down what if jesus asked you this question it's, it's kind of like when I go to the pharmacy and I'm picking up a prescription for Carson or Griffin and they say, his birthday. And like, I never remember this question is coming. And so I always like have to rifle through four kids. And then I, I'm like, I know my show. I, I've seen like this terrible parent all of a sudden because I'm like having to go, oh, it's in May for, he's in March, he's in May. Because they're all in March and May and except for Griffin, he's February. And then they're all multiples of seven. Is he 14 or 21? Because they're out of order, I think. And I'm just sitting there and they're like, are you a crazy person, or do you, is this your child, or are you a drug seeker? I mean, that's, like, it catches me off, I know the answer, but it always catches me off guard, and I'm just telling you, that if Jesus sat down next to you and said, who do you say that I am, and you can't lie, what would that be like, what would you say, what would you say, because I know we can make, we might stumble, I always get the right answer, by the way, on the birthday, eventually, uh, but I might because sometimes I put, I'll say oh March March 21st or no March 14th of 2003 wrong date everything else is right and I'll, oh, no 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 it's May it's Mar- May March and sometimes I'll turn Carson when's your birthday <laughs> it's like oh dad it's it's just amazing what a question can do to us Jesus asked you this he asked you who do you say that I am Because when I did this in my office, this kind of little exercise, I was thinking, like, all right, I know the right answer, but I automatically go to how I live, right? If he asks me that question, I'm automatically, in my mind, I'm going, all right, my actions. Am I living like what I want to answer verbally? And there's always this big gap. It's always this inconsistency between, hey, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then maybe how I'm living. And the the, the comforting thing today is, that was true of Peter too. He got the right answer. He says it. He says it. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the Messiah. I know that. 
I, Peter says, I get that. You're the, anoint, you're the Messiah of God, the long-awaited one who would come and deliver Israel and the people of God, and you would establish the kingdom of God among, among men. You are the Messiah. And he says, you are the son of the living God. It's kind of a twofold answer. You're the son of of the living God and literally means the offspring of God and, and he's identifying Jesus as God's unique son and, and he's, he's speaking to this but here's what I see here's what I see is that Jesus says who do people say the son of man is who do people say the son of man Jesus' favorite title of himself was the son of man not the son of God that, that is the most frequent usage of his own description of himself was the son of man he says who does the son they said the son of man is and peter's response is you're the son of god i don't know this for sure okay so just let me speculate and i couldn't in in, in study and research i didn't find a definitive answer here but but i think peter already got i think he was at the point where he he knew the son of man part. He, his, he, he saw this part of Jesus. And it was, it was a fresh awareness as he saw miracles unfold. He's the son of God. This is God. This is the Messiah. This is the anointed one of God. This, and you, that's who you are. And, 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 and Jesus affirms his answer, right? He says, blessed are you, Simon, because you didn't just figure this out. God showed you that. So if we could just step into that answer that Jesus gives him, let's just step there. It is not up to you to just figure it out. It's not about how smart you are. This is not, this is not something, I would tell you, this is not something the human brain can just generate. This, this conviction that Jesus is the Son of God, that God has come to humanity in a human body, but he's all of God. This defies everything we know Biologically, this defies everything we know experientially that, that you could be God and a human being at the same time. This is so incongruent with logic and, and science even. This makes no sense to any of that. And so it requires us a, a posture of openness before God to say, say, I want to, I need you to show me, to, in, to embed in me that you are the Son of Man and the Son of God. You are the Word of God who has become flesh. You are God in a human body. And, and that's where Peter was. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were on son of man. They just were, they couldn't go beyond, hey, he's a person, he's a teacher. We can admit that God might use him. We can admit and see that he's got some power. But, man, this is, he's not God. In fact, it was Jesus' declaration that he was God in the flesh that got him ultimately crucified. Some people see him as a really good person today still. You talk to people about who Jesus is. If you were to just walk around and ask people at wherever you go for lunch or wherever you go to work tomorrow or whatever, if you just ask people, you're going to get two basic answers. Some of them are going to be, hey, he's the son of God, he's the Messiah. Others are going to say, we will think he was here and a really good person kind of thing. He was a good person. He's a good teacher. I think he's moral. I think he's not, he's not bad to follow his teaching, but he's not the son of God. And, and, then, and then you can get kind of variances thereof. There's still a lot of confusion in the populace among the people about who Jesus is. But here's the problem. Here's the deal. Is that there can, there's still a lot of confusion in our lives still. Because if we just walk through life and we don't reorient ourselves to this, if we don't allow Jesus to ask us this question, we will drift to one side of that pendulum or the other. We'll begin to relate to him as just a really good teacher with a lot of great moral values, but not a lot of power. Or we will swing over here and think, man, he's God. He is all-powerful. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is other than me. You won't relate to him. You won't. It's going to be very difficult to step into that reality. And I listen. It doesn't matter whether you're an elementary school, high school, college, in the middle of your work career, raising a family, or you're retired, looking back at a lot of life. It doesn't matter. This is this is pertinent. This is powerful. This is so relevant for every single person who walks through here. So I want to ask you this question. Let's just do it right now. Let's just say this: If Jesus is primarily even, let's just say we're and I know you know, we know the right answers cognitively. So when I say if, you understand that's rhetorical. If, 
if, if we're relating to Jesus as mostly as a human being and we're just kind of swung that way, we're going to be drawn to him because he's a really good human being. In fact, he's perfect. And his teachings are powerful and fresh and admirable and attractive. But we're not going to really rely on him because he's still just a person. And if he's just a person, he can't really be present with me. And there's a lot of problems. But if he's primarily God, we're just going to kind of back away from him because we're not going to feel like we can relate to him. We're going to feel like he's distant. We're going to feel like he's maybe probably angry, disappointed in me. And, and by the way, if that's where you are today, if you're feeling like you, every time you get close to God, he's kind of going, man, you're just kind of, you kind of disappoint me. Or, man, I'm frustrated that you can't get it right. That's the, that's the, you're relating to God as, as, as to Jesus as, as the one who is all God and not very human at all, that is, he doesn't understand your plight. So, of course, the great need to know and embrace the reality of Jesus is fully human and fully God. I get that. We know that. I think we, that's an easy thing to understand. But today, what I'm asking you to do is to realize where you are in that, to ask yourself that question, to let Jesus step into your world and ask yourself that very question. So some of us, some of us need to recapture the humanity part. Some of us need to reorient to the to the deity of Jesus, to the God side of Jesus, the all and, and this is all or nothing. By the way, it's not 50-50. He's not part God, part man. He's all God, all man. So to do this, here's where we're going to wrap this up, kind of bring this to home. And hopefully I think this I think this will connect with you. I did this, so I'm just walk. With you. I'm going to read a scripture, and uh, I just want you to insert yourself to it. And you can be, uh, you can be the person that Jesus is dealing with. Uh, you can be a spectator. You can be whatever you just be a part of the story. Okay. So this is just a brief, brief part. It's Mark chapter one, verses forty through forty-two. And here's what it says. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus. I want you to picture that. A man with leprosy. He has wounds, open wounds. He's been, he's been ostracized from his family. He lives in a colony outside the town with only other lepers. He can't go to church. He can't uh, relate to God. He's been told that he's been stricken by God with this disease because of sin. This is this man's condition in a brief, brief narrative. This is this man's condition. This man, and by the way, when he walked through town, he had to yell unclean so that people could part the way. No, he hasn't been touched. He hasn't been hugged. He hasn't been dealt with as a human being since he contracted this disease. This, is the man, this man comes to Jesus, and he kneels down in front of Jesus. Have you ever just, I mean... Can you imagine what it, I know you don't go around kneeling down in front of people, but can you imagine what that's like? What is that what feeling does that evoke? To kneel down in front of Jesus begging to be healed. And here's what he says. This is a very important statement. He says this leprosy ridden man says, "If you are willing, you can Heal me and make me clean. He says to Jesus, kneeling down in front of him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Somebody tell me what he's not questioning there. Just tell me. What's he not questioning? His power. His, he's not doubting whether he can or can't. What's he questioning? Is he willing to? Is he willing to? Do identity. This is all about identity. I want to propose this to you. If that leper had understood at that point that this Jesus was fully human and fully God, he wouldn't have questioned his willingness. He wouldn't have misunderstood. He would know. He would have. He would have related to. He would have understood that Jesus knew. What's that like to go, Jesus knows what it's like to be me. Jesus knows this condition. Jesus understands this condition. So look at what he says, the rest of what he says. Moved with compassion. That was Jesus' response. It literally means his, his 
the inside of Jesus was turned upside down. It was it was in turmoil almost. It was you know when you really feel an emotion deeply, how you feel it physically, especially when it's like a compassionate, sympathetic response to somebody. That's what it's describing here with Jesus. And it says moved with compassion. Quite literally, he was moved because he says he reached out. And what did he do? He didn't just say point at him. He touched this man who nobody had touched and since he had gotten the disease. And he said these incredible words, I am willing. He said, be healed. Be healed. Now, he understood that Jesus could see be healed, but he didn't know if Jesus would say, I am willing. And, I, and then and it says instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. I, I just want you to think about this for a minute. What would it be like to be that man and Jesus touching him, putting his hand on his head, his shoulder, his back, his, uh, holding his head, whatever it was, and saying, looking at him and saying, I'm willing. And so there, there are people that are sitting here today, I have no doubt whatsoever, you need to hear Jesus say that. I am willing. Because you're asking him a question, are you willing? And Jesus is saying, I am willing. It's all about answering that question, who do you say that I am? Who do you know? The, how are you relating to Jesus today? Who do you see him to be? Do you understand that he is this person of compassion and power, of, of, of the ability to relate to you, to know your pain, to care about it, and be willing to look at you and be with you and declare healing, forgiveness, restoration over your life? But others of us might need to be reminded that God really is tremendously, in every respect, powerful, sovereign, infinite in wisdom. In Mark chapter 4, in verses 37 through 41, Jesus tells the disciples that they're going to go to the other side of the sea. And, and, and here's where it picks up in Mark chapter 3, 4, 3, verse 37. There arose a fierce gale of wind like a massive storm, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. This reminds me of, of me and my brothers. I've been in this situation almost, not quite to this degree, but wasn't really far. It's one of those situations you don't tell your parents about until you're well beyond the years of accountability for foolish actions, shall we say. It's really one of those things your parents don't want to hear until you're well beyond these these years. So uh, we were we were pilot, we were coming back from duck hunting, and uh, we were going through a, a, a cement dam had between two lakes had had broken and there was a gap in it probably as wide as maybe this front row of chairs, and when it rained the water was pouring through that thing. We thought this quite exciting. We were in a John boat with two paddles, okay? <laughs> this is terrifying to even recount for me now. But we were trying to paddle against that current that was coming through that funnel. And I remember the waves hitting so hard that they're just, they're spilling, there's water gathering in the, in the bottom of our boat. We're going nowhere, like nowhere, as hard as we paddle. And my brother Danny, you just have to know him, he's, He's got his PhD, he is brilliant, and he is insanely goofy. And I just remember, <laughs> remember him in the back of the boat yelling to me and my brother, stroke, stroke, stroke. <laughs> we were stroking to the point where we thought we were going to have a stroke, and I thought I was going to die because I thought the water was going to fill up our boat. Somehow we made it through. It's a lot easier to go back through it the other way, which we did on the way back. I'm telling you, I mean, I read this story and I think of that. They were terrified. I was terrified. These disciples that night, they were terrified. But Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We are about to die. And he got up, Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the sea and said to the sea, Hush or peace, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? We're going to deal with this question later, by the way. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, listen to their question, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this man that was asleep in the stern, 
that even the wind and the sea obey him. They weren't asking if he was willing. They, when they came to Jesus, well, they were, well, there was a, a question of willingness, but it was, uh, we need your help. We are dying here. And Jesus showed up with more than help, didn't he? He didn't just help paddle through the storm. He just stood up and said, hush, be still. A clear declaration of his authority over creation. And you might need to know that today because, listen, if a doctor said it's cancer, if a spouse said it's over, if the funeral home called and, and told you the appointment that you got to go make arrangements for, all of life's things that crash in on you, the storms that make you feel like you're drowning, we feel, I have felt just like those disciples. Like Jesus is calmly sleeping, and I've interpreted his calmness as indifference, or like I didn't matter, or like he's just taking his eye off the wheel. Or, and, and, didn't, and I asked the thing, well, do you care? I mean, do you care? And then, and then amazingly looking back, looking back, I can see Jesus time and time again in my life stand up and just with a word bring stillness, bring peace, bring calm, bring order. He's still king of the universe. So I'll ask you today, who, who do you say, not just with your words, but with your life, who do you say Jesus is? How are your how are your actions declarative of what you really think about Jesus? I want to tell you as we conclude the message it's, it's obvious he's the son of the living God and the son of man he knows your every weakness he knows every pain every problem, every frailty he gets it and he can do something about it you need to know that he's willing and you need to know that he's able. And he will not always he will not always play according to our script, will he? When I say not always, I mean something like almost never. <laughs> that my script is always vastly insufficient for the goodness that Jesus wants to actually bring in my life. So I'm learning this. I'm learning to come I'm learning to come and say something like this when the storm is raging or when I feel like the leper. I'm learning to come before Jesus fully aware of who he is and say, here's in my very limited understanding what I would love to see happen. Here's just the honest condition of my heart, the desires. But I know even when it doesn't feel like it, I know that you want me what is truly good and best for me and I'm learning church I can't emphasize enough to say I'm learning to step back after that and say I trust that you will be good and you will be faithful and I can rest he sometimes touches and says be clean sometimes he stands up and says to my circumstances be still and either way I am reminded that we have an amazing Jesus staggers me with who he really truly is. Who do you say he is? Let's pray. Father, as we sang just a while ago, we are reminded that you are a good and faithful daddy. You are tender and caring, compassionate, patient, merciful, understanding, knowing, wise. You are the God who is infinitely more powerful than the lightning storm we watched in our southern sky last night. You are infinitely more creative than the beautiful panorama of clouds we got to see uh, painted with pinks and yellows and grays and blues last night. And yet you take the time to kneel down in front of me when I'm in a crumpled heap and tenderly care and powerfully restore. 
And I really do relate maybe most of all to the disciples when they say, who then is this man? You are king, and you are my friend, all in one. And at wonder, in wonder, I bow before you. And I pray on behalf of those in this room who are who are wrestling and rowing against the current, who are fighting the battle, who feel exhausted and depleted, who are confused and bewildered, who are terrified, who are bored, who are complacent, who feel utterly disappointed or wrestle with a sense of failure that seems permanent. That you, Jesus, you, all that you are, would step into the circle of their life and their circumstances, and you would speak what needs to be spoken. And I know and trust and believe you will be who you truly are and you will raise our eyes to see that bring newness and hope bring strength and comfort bring perspective and passion and God we will love you in return not because of what you've done but because of who you are And we love you today and we're thankful in Jesus great name amen as we close, Mike's going to come up and play um, a chorus, but I want to read something to you. If, if there's perhaps a passage, there are many, but one of the most p profound and maybe relatable, if I can use that word, passages that is descriptive of the identity of Jesus, um, it's Colossians chapter 1, and I'm just going to, there's, there's, it's pretty lengthy, so I'm just going to pick a part of that passage. In verse 15, speaking of Jesus, it says this. And listen to how you hear both God and man in this description. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. He, Jesus, is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. Jesus is also head of the body, this church, and Jesus is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that Jesus himself will come to have first place in everything, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself having made peace through the blood of his cross through Jesus I say whether things on earth or things in heaven and although uh, I'm just going to end there because we could just keep going I want to ask you to dwell on that if you could have a homework assignment would you read through Colossians chapter 1 uh, you could read through all three chapters but dwell on it just let it sink and so that we could be where Peter was where flesh and blood did not have to reveal it because it could not Mike would you come yeah you can do whatever you want absolutely Hey, I just want to say thanks. I, I've been here a couple times since we left. We're a year and a half into this church plant, and uh, uh, you guys have, have been supportive of us. And, and I, I just, I know we're supposed to sing, but I just want to take a minute and tell you guys thank you for your support, prayer, prayerful support, your financial support. Um, it's different than I thought, but it's good. And we're learning these things, you know, even this week for, for my family. It's been a rough one, and um, it's different. You know, you're not surrounded by people, as many people, and so you, it gets lonely sometimes, you know, if we're just being honest. And so um, we're learning this thing about about seeing Jesus for who he is and, and um, you know, what he wants us to do. And it's not always what we want, um, but if, if we learn, we you know, sat in Casey's group this morning, man, if we can just try to try to focus on his plan for our life, everything looks a little brighter than it does if, if we try to figure it out on our own. But, um, man, we're faithfully meeting each week.
Uh, we meet on Monday nights, and we have a youth uh, group that meets on Friday nights. We got eight teenagers coming when they all show up, so we're excited about that. And um, we just started. We had serve day. I want to thank you guys that came out and helped with that. That was really awesome. Got to spend a lot of time with the Veerlings that week. They were out every night, and some of the other folks. So uh, it, it was a good week. And um, uh, from that, we've started a, a once a month public gathering. So uh, we just feel like like uh, um, you know God's moving. And, and, and we just really can't wait to see what happens from here. But I just wanted to really say thank you on, on behalf of our family for your support. So 